Welcome everybody to our seminar. This is the second talk in our uh, repro reproducibility series here in Basel. And we are very, it's a great pleasure for us to welcome Tracy Weisgerber from Berlin. She is uh, a group leader at the Quest Center for Reproducible, no, Responsible Research at the Berlin Institute of Health at the Charité. And um, she has a PhD in kinesiology and she worked also before in Mayo clinics. And now she is uh, focusing on meta research, meaning how to do good research, doing research on how to do research in a good way. And today she will teach us about how to visualize our data in the best way. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. And I've been looking forward to this. So. I am just working on sharing my screen here. That worked out. <laughs> Excellent. It's always a good way to start the uh, <laughs> seminar. OK, um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about data visualization and how to recognize and fix some common problems. There are three topics that I'm going to cover today rather lightly. I won't have time to go into lots of details about everything, so I will refer you to some other resources and places if you would like more information on these topics or other visualization re related topics. So the first topic is some general tips and tricks for designing many different kinds of kinds of figures. The second thing I'll spend time on is the inappropriate use of bar graphs for continuous data. So why you shouldn't use them and what you should use instead. And then at the end, I'll talk about some other common problems you might see and how to recognize and fix those things. Before we get started, since this is part of a reproducibility seminar series, I think it's important to talk about why data visualization belongs in a reproducibility discussion. Um, when we think about reproducibility, we're thinking about our sharing our methods and our data and perhaps our code. Um, there are a lot of different factors that come into play. And so why do figures deserve to be part of that discussion? I would argue that figures are especially important because data presentation is the foundation of our collective scientific knowledge. So normally when we read a paper, we use the figures to show the most important findings. And often the data underlying those figures aren't publicly available. And that means that the information presented in the figures or in the tables is all that we will ever know about the data underlying that study and underlying those conclusions. And if we're systematically designing poor figures or using or types of figures that obscure or mislead potentially about the data, then we can create problems with others' interpretation of our study, not only in the present, but also in the future. And no one wants to be responsible for ruining the future. So visualization is really important. So there are two common but incorrect assumptions that we tend to make when we're designing figures. And I'm just gonna highlight both of these and then I'll talk about them a little bit. The first thing that we assume is that readers read the abstract and the introduction and the methods before they ever get to the results and the figures. And this is often incorrect. And the second thing that we assume is that if we can interpret the figure as the people who collected the data, then our readers can also interpret the figure. And this is also not a good assumption. So let's talk about these two things in more details. We know from lots of anecdotal reports from editors, from reviewers, and from scientists that many people actually examine the figures first along with the title and abstract, and they use those figures as a decision tool to decide whether they want to take a deeper look at the paper. So a lot of scientists, reviewers, and editors report that they go directly to the figures after they read the title and the abstract and perhaps the last sentence of the introduction. We know that search engines like PubMed or journal websites often allow readers to examine the figures along with the title and the abstract, making it easier for scientists to get this visual information. And we also know that many scientists are sharing image-based figures or other types of figures on posters, in social media, and in talks. And all of these mean that your figures are providing readers with a lot of, or potential readers, with a lot of information about whether they should look into your paper in more detail. And so it's important that those figures are easy to understand and interpret to someone who hasn't read your entire, entire paper in order. 
So when we're designing figures, we always want to remember to design figures for a broad audience. The audience for most papers is broader than we anticipate. So when we're writing our papers, we may be thinking that some scientists in our field who study our particular topic will be interested in our work. But our readers are often going to include scientists in our field who are just answering questions or looking at the topic in very different ways using different methods. It might also include scientists in related fields, reviewers or editors who may come from different fields and subject areas, potentially patients or educators are interested in your work, as well as the people who fund your work might be reading your paper. And things that are clear to you could be very confusing to someone who comes from a different area of science, who has different training and different expertise, or maybe to someone who isn't a scientist at all. And so when we're designing figures, it's very important to remember that we're designing figures for our audience and not for ourselves. And our figures need to be self-explanatory and clearly explain what it is that we want them to show. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, and this is an image with three different levels of annotation. And so I'll ask you to think about if you were reading a paper and you just saw this first panel or this first image with no annotation on it, would you know what was going on here? Now, perhaps you're lucky enough to be someone who does electron microscopy on mouse beta, pancreatic beta islet cells, and you would recognize that that's what this is. And you would know what all the colors and the different parts represent. I would not. Um, I would see this and I would have no idea what's going on here. And so there's a second version where some annotation is provided and the authors have, you know, the creator of the figure has used a pink shaded region to highlight some peripheral insulin secretory vesicles, some arrows to show where the mitochondria are, and then lines to indicate the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And this is helpful. It gives me some orientation to the figure, what type of cell I might be looking at and where different structures are located and how they might look. In the third panel, I have excessive labels and the figure is very hard to interpret. So there are many different kinds of labels. Those labels are often covering the image itself, making it difficult to see what's going on. And then I also have this giant text list of what all of those symbols represent below. And this doesn't really help me because if I want to know what the blue thing is, I have to read all the way down until I find um, this notation for blue shape here. Or if I want to know what the big white arrow is, then I have to read down until I find white fat arrow. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And your readers don't have time. They're impatient and they're busy and they have stuff to do. So let's say maybe for the sake of our answering our research question, we do need to readers to understand this level of detail about the figure. What might we do to fix this? Well, one of the solutions that we could use would be to use the figure as its own legend. So here I have the figure itself, and then there's a second version of that figure, which is covered with a semi-transparent white shading, and that allows the labels to stand out a little bit more. I then have all of my labels here, so I can go and compare, okay, the blue region seems to be these darker regions on the main figure. Um, the square seems to correspond to this dark region here. And then the legend has been made much easier to understand, so I can now pair blue region, okay, that's right here. And this makes it much faster for me to understand what's going on in this figure. So one of the things that we want to do when we're writing a paper is to identify the concepts that are most technically challenging for your audience and create visualizations. Visualizations can often get through to people much more quickly. So whatever type of article you're writing, whether it's original research article or a review, um, or perhaps even a small editorial, a figure can really help to illustrate the difficult concepts so that you waste less time and fewer words describing those concepts. And when we do this for our work, we'll typically design all of our figures for the paper first, and then we just use the text to connect the concepts of those different figures and to guide the reader from one figure to the next. So how do we design figures? Well, generally speaking, we want to follow three steps. The first is to define the objective of the figure. And we typically want all elements or all panels within a figure to answer a single research question. 
And this is a bit of a challenging thing because when there are limits on figure, the number of figures, we tend to put as many panels as we can possibly get into the figures. And those panels may be related to different research experiments. Um, they may answer different research questions, but generally speaking, if you have the opportunity to create your figures the way you want them. You want to define your figure objectives and then make sure that all elements in a single figure answer a, the same research question. So the next thing you've done, once you've defined your objective for your figure, you want to organize and plan your figure using a figure planning table. And then you want to plan the layout of your panels using a figure layout sketch. So we'll take a quick look at what this process might look like. So let's say the objective of my figure is to illustrate the effects of an animal model and an experimental treatment on the phenotype of pups and placentas. So I have a clear objective statement. The next thing I'm going to do is create a figure panel planning table. And this is going to list each panel in my figure, the objective of each panel, the types of visualizations that I want in that panel, the experimental groups those visualizations will show, and then any notes that I want to make about how to design the figure. So for this one, I'm going to have three panels, and I'll call them A, B, and C. For panel A, I want to illustrate differences in pup phenotype, and I'm going to want a photograph showing the individual pups, as well as a chart that perhaps shows the weight of those pups. I'm going to have four different groups, the control group that received placebo and an experimental group that received the placebo, and then a control group and an experimental group that received the treatment. And then I have some notes here to remember that I need a scale bar when I'm making the photograph, so I want to include a ruler in that photograph, and then I want the chart to be a box plot illustrating the weight of the pups. So for my second panel, panel I want to illustrate the differences in the phenotype of placentas. Here again, I'm going to have a photograph and a chart and the same groups. I again want a ruler in my photograph and a box plot illustrating placental weight. And then in the third panel, I want to illustrate differences in histology in the placenta. For example, I want to show staining of placental tissue for two different biomarkers. So here I might have a micro photograph and I might want one image per group and separate rows or columns for each of my biomarkers. So now that I know what my panels are going to be, what each of them will include, and what their objectives are, the next step is to create a figure layout sketch. And this might look like either one of these two designs here. So generally speaking, our eye goes from left to right and from top to bottom. And so the layout in rows makes it easy for our eyes to follow from left to right and top to bottom, whereas the layout in columns makes it easy for our eyes to travel from top to bottom as then from left to right. And we always want to have some white space in between our panels to guide the eye and to separate out those different panels. So for my layout in rows, I might put the first panel with the photograph in the dot plot and then the second panel. And below, I might have one row per biomarker. For the layout in columns, I might put panel A above panel B, and then I might do a square um, for each of my four groups for biomarker one and then for biomarker two. Either of these layouts would help to answer my research question. Okay, the next thing you need to do is learn to critique and refine your figures. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go through an example of this today, but I do have one. So if people would like to see that during the question period, I can show that. Um, one way that you can do this is by testing visualizations to identify problems and whether or not your visualization is achieving its targeted goals. And so you can do this with 10 to 30 second tests. So I find a random individual who's walking by my desk, I stick my figure in front of them and I ask them to tell me what it says after they've looked at it for 10 seconds or 30 seconds and usually 10 seconds for a less complicated figure, 30 seconds for a more complicated figure. And if the main message that they're getting from the figure is not the main message that I was hoping they would get, then I know I still need to do some redesign. I can also do tests on Twitters. Um, and I can additionally ask a co-author to check my calculations and summary statistics that are shown in my visualizations and potentially to recreate data figures in a different software to make sure that there are no errors. And then I can also consider depositing those visualizations in an online repository. So we regularly get requests to reuse our figures. 
And having everything in an online repository makes it easy to reuse things that are openly licensed and um, makes that a passive process. So people don't have to come to me and then wait for me to respond to their email. They can just go to the repository, download the figure, and then use it as they would like. Okay. The next point um, that's good to know about designing figures is that we can use a concept called emphasis and de-emphasis both to direct attention and to avoid overplotting. And I'll show you a couple of examples of what this might look like. So here's our first example. Um, and I have two different dot plots here. In the first dot plot, I have six different groups, a lot of dots and some median lines. And what's going on here is that everything is emphasized. So everything is black, axes, um, the data points and the median lines. And I'm really not sure what to look at or what's important. When I use emphasis and de-emphasis, I want to emphasize certain figures by placing them in black or in a color in the foreground, and then I de-emphasize other features by placing them in gray in the background. So here I've de-emphasized my uh, axes, and I've also de-emphasized the individual dots, and then I've emphasized the median lines, which are in the foreground. So what's going to happen when I view this figure is my eyes will immediately go to the median lines and I'll see that this third group has higher values. But then I can still look back and see, okay, how many data points are in each group? How are those data points distributed? And so on and so forth. Here's a second example. And in this case, I have combined two different plots. Um, so I have a box plot and a dot plot. And I also have a median line, which is further emphasized in red. So in the first plot, I have emphasized the dot plot. It is in black and in the foreground. Um, also extra emphasis on the median line, which is in red in the foreground. And then I've de-emphasized the box plot, which is in gray in the background. Here in the second panel, I have the reverse of this. So the median line is still emphasized, but I have <clears throat> emphasized the box plot more by placing it in back and in, in the foreground. And then I de-emphasize the data points by placing them in gray and in the background. Okay. That's all I'm gonna say about figure design for today because we have limited time. However, I would encourage you to check out these three resources if you're interested in more information on this topic. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is why and how to replace your bar graphs of continuous data with more informative figures. So the first thing I wanna emphasize is that I know we have an MRI intensive group here. The research that I do often, often focuses on small sample size data sets. And the reason that we look at fields where small sample size data sets are common is that small data sets are common in the basic biomedical and biological sciences, as well as in translational science. And those data sets influence decisions about what potential treatments advance to clinical trials and further research. So we know when we look at preclinical studies, sample sizes of six, eight, or 10 animals per group are common. And when the National Institutes of Health in the US is highlighting problems with reproducibility, they are especially concerned with preclinical research. Clinical trials have undergone a number of changes in the past decades to focus on pre-registration, blinding, randomization, whereas those changes are less commonly seen in preclinical or in vitro research and in small sample size studies. So, what should figures do? Well, effective figures should do three things. The first is that they should immediately convey information about the study design. So the first thing is that I should know by looking at your figure, whether you are comparing independent groups or conducting a longitudinal study where you're measuring the same individual across different time points or under different conditions, or perhaps whether you have paired or matched individuals. The next thing that they should do is allow readers to confirm that the statistical analysis is appropriate for the study design. So I should be able to see from the design of your figure that yes, your statistical analysis does match what I would expect for that study design. The third thing is that they should illustrate important findings. And the fourth thing is that they should allow the reader to evaluate critically the data. And often when we're designing our figures, we really focus on point three, and we forget about all of these other things that are equally important. And it's point four, allowing the reader to evaluate critically the data, where graphs like bar graphs and line graphs that we use very often um, have severe limitations. So 
I just want to emphasize that this work comes from my own research in preeclampsia. So when we think about preeclampsia, we recognize that well, women generally have a variety of different pathophysiological pathways, they commonly end up with the same set of problems in late pregnancy. Um, and that so that the underlying pathways may include problems with the placenta, with the fetus, with the mother, and different particular pathways within each of those. And so when we're looking at biomarkers or pathophysiological processes in women with preeclampsia, we expect that any process we look at will be perfectly normal in some women with preeclampsia and very abnormal in other women with preeclampsia. And the focus of the field right now is really on identifying subgroups of women that have particular pathways of disease. And unfortunately, there are no subgroups in a, in a bar, bar graph or a line graph. Um, the bar graphs and the line graphs are only showing summary statistics. They're what we show when we want to mask heterogeneity. If we want to understand heterogeneity, we need to use more informative figures. So my frustration with the use of bar graphs in my field and in many others led to this work um, where we conducted a systematic review of papers that had presented continuous data in top, NI or in top physiology journals over a three month period. Um, we reviewed more than 700 different papers because that's what transatlantic flights and jet lag are for. And this paper was viewed more than 100,000 times in the first month that it was published. And since it was published, it had led, has led to policy changes in a number of different journals, encouraging authors to replace their bar graphs with more informative graphics. So what did the paper conclude? Well, first we had systematic review data. Um, we found that almost all papers were using bar or line graphs to present continuous data. So 85% of figures had a bar graph, 61% had a line graph. When it came to the more informative figures like dot plots, box plots, or histograms, we don't really use those. So only 13% of papers had dot plot and five to 8% had a histogram or a box plot. We also found that sample sizes were very small, in most cases less than 10 independent observations per group, that 78% of bar graphs were showing the mean and standard error, and that more than 50% of papers that were using non-parametric analyses presented data that they'd analyzed non-parametrically as mean and standard error or mean and standard deviation. And this is a particular concern because often we use non-parametric analyses when the sample isn't large enough for us to know what the data distribution is, or we know that the data distribution is not normal, and hence the mean and standard deviation or standard error are likely to be misleading. So you might be wondering, um, we published a paper that got a lot of attention and changed some journal policies, so have we solved the problem yet? Well, we did a second analysis late in 2018, and we switched fields this time to peripheral vascular disease journals. We looked at the top 25% of journals on that list for September 2018. And what we found was that among papers that had any type of data figure, almost half of them had bar graphs of continuous data. And that meant that bar graphs of continuous data were the most common type of data figure of any of the types of data figures that people were using. And that also makes them the most common data visualization problem. And second place was not close. Um, so these are really much more common than anything else in certain fields, which means we still have work to do. Okay, so you may be wondering if lots of people are using bar graphs of continuous data, what's the problem and why shouldn't I use them? Well, one of the problems is that many different data distributions can lead to the same bar graph and the actual data may suggest different conclusions from the summary statistics alone. And so this is an example of four different data distributions that will potentially lead you to the same bar graph. And one important thing to note here is that the first thing I see when I look at the dot plots is all of these are very, very small data sets. And so there is a lot of uncertainty in all of these data sets, and I shouldn't be too confident in any of them. But if I look at the first distribution here in panel B, I see that the second group is slightly higher than the first group. That might be a difference I'm interested in. In the next group panel, I have an outlier. Um, one observation is much higher than the others, and that's pulling up the values for the second group. Unclear whether I would be so interested in this one. 
In the third one, my distribution again, or my sample size is really too small to tell how the data are distributed, but there's some suggestion that I have a cluster of high values and a cluster of low values. So I might want more data to know whether this is actually a bimodal distribution. And if it was, I want to know if that those two different peaks are explained by different factors. So for example, perhaps men consistently have lower values than women. And in that case, I should be accounting for sex or gender in my analysis. And then in the last case, we have a case of unequal n. And so the values for the second group are clustered at the high end of the observations for the first group. But again, I have a very small sample size. It could simply be that I've underestimated the variability in that group. Um, and so I would want more data to confirm this. And importantly, I can't distinguish between these situations based on the p-value alone. There's really no substitute for seeing the data. Okay, so you might be wondering if you can still use a bar graph if you know that your data are normally distributed. And the answer to this question is, of course, no. Um, and there are two different reasons why using a bar graph still isn't a good idea. The first one is that the bar graph doesn't allow you to critically evaluate the data. So if I look at a dot plot, I can see the data distribution, I can see the sample size, I'm getting a lot more information. None of that information is found in the bar graph. The second problem with the bar graph is it arbitrarily assigns importance to the height of the bar instead of the amount of overlap between our groups, which is what I really want to know about, and it also distorts our perception of the range of observed values. So very often with my bar graph, I will start it at zero and I will end it just above the height of the highest error bar in the group. And that means that I may end up with a zone of invisibility at the top. So these are observations that are actually present in my data set, but don't appear in my graph. And then in some cases, zero is a biologically or physiologically meaningful value. In other cases, it really isn't. And if the values around zero are not physiologically possible and will never occur in your data set, you can end up dedicating a lot of your graph to this zone of irrelevance where there will never be data. Um, so again, this is just another way that the bar graph is shifting our perception of the data distribution and giving us misleading information. So what do I want you to take away from this? I'd like you to remember that our interpretation depends on what we see. So if I look at the bar graph, I'm a passive observer. I can see that I have four groups, that the values in one group are slightly higher than the values in the other group. Maybe that's a difference I'm interested in. Maybe I'm not, it's hard to say. If I see the actual data set, I'm immediately a more actively engaged participant. So I know that the sample sizes are very small, that maybe there's an outlier in this group, um, that this, this group here that has the higher values is even smaller than the others. And hence, there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding these conclusions. So it engages me in a much more active way. And I would argue that science is all about being able to critically evaluate each other's data and each other's work. And so the bar graph is more what we would use for marketing. And the, the dot plot or the more informative graph is what we need for science. So what I want you to remember here is that all data presentation methods are a reflection of reality. So you designed your experiment looking for a duck and you see what you think is a duck when you get your data back. Um, but looking at your data in a bar graph or a line graph is a little bit like looking at a, at a reflection in a wavy pond. So you think that it looks like a duck but maybe it's a duck or maybe it's just an oddly shaped potato. It's hard to tell. And no one wants to waste time or money or resources pursuing something they thought was a duck only to find out that it's an oddly shaped potato. So it's important to select methods that minimize distortion. Okay, so what should we use instead? Um, it depends. There is a lot of information in this graph. I just want you to know that this figure exists because it's a useful resource to refer to when you're trying to decide what you do with your own data, but I'm going to go through it very quickly and just highlight some key points. If you're working with a very small data set, then you should use a dot plot. Summary statistics are only meaningful when you have enough data to summarize. Once you start to get larger data sets, summary statistics that are shown in histogram or in box plots or violin plots can become more meaningful. And so you can begin to combine your dot plot with a box plot or a violin plot. At some point, your data set will become large enough that there are far too many dots to keep track of and they're blocking each other and obscuring each other and creating confusion. At that point, you can go ahead and just show the box plot or the violin plot.
If you happen to have a bimodal or multimodal data set, you should never use a box plot, always use a violin plot. The multiple different modes won't be visible in a box plot, they will be obscured, so the violin plot is a better choice. And finally, the bar graph should not be used for continuous data. It should be used for what it's intended for, which is counter proportions, where the height of the bar shows the value of the counter proportion. Okay, some people still prefer bar graphs because they convey a clear message and it can be hard to see what's going on with dot plots. The good news here is that you can have both a clear message and um, a dot plot. And this is just an example of how we do that. So the first thing that we do is we make all our data points visible. And there's a series of strategies that you can use for this, but the best one is symmetric jittering, where we spread the points out along the um, across each group in a way that's symmetrical so that our eye can trace the outline of the data distribution. And then the second thing we want to do is use emphasis we can emphasize the mean or median line, the summary statistics, and then we can de-emphasize the data points and the axes so that I immediately get information about the general trend in the data, but I can also go back and evaluate the data more critically. So one of the things that's really popular these days is to just add dot plots to your bar graph. And you might be wondering, is this okay? And it's better than a bar graph alone, but I wouldn't recommend it. And the reason is that the dot plot gives you everything you need and nothing you don't. Um, so I can see the means, the degree or medians, the degree of overlap between groups, and there's no information obscuring or obstructing my view of those things. When I combine a bar graph with a dot plot, I can introduce a number of problems. Firstly, I have this shading on the bar, which obscures my data points. The second thing I have is that these bar and these bars and the filling are essentially chart junk. So the solid shape gives me the illusion of certainty without adding information. So it's just as solid for my bar, whether I have two observations or 2000 observations, and those are vastly different scenarios. The next thing is that I may have a zone of irrelevance in the data in my graph, as we've discussed previously, and then I might also introduce something called within the bar bias. And this is an effect where our eye believes that data points are more likely to fall within the bar compared to above the bar. And so we can introduce some distortion based on the way we perceive the graph of where we think the data points are. You might be wondering if you need expensive software to make these figures, and the answer is no. There are lots of free online tools or resources available. Some of you may use things like R and Python, which will certainly allow you to make these types of graphs. And if you're using R, then our new flipbook in R will show you line by line how to make all of the graphs shown in this Q&A. Um, and you can also see table three in our circulation paper for more details and tools that will work for your data. So you may be wondering if it matters how you did your statistical analysis. And of course, it definitely matters how you did your statistical analysis. So remember that I said earlier that the figure structure tells the reader about your experimental design and allows the reader to confirm that your design matches your analysis. So it's important to avoid sending mixed messages. And I'll give you an example of this, of something that we commonly see in papers. So let's say my goal is to compare two different types of mice, mild type and knockout mice. And for my statistical analyses, I use t-tests to compare values for each of my different biomarkers. Um, what you commonly see people do is put all three of those biomarkers on the same graph. And then as the reader, I'm confused because the, the graph structure to me suggests that not only did you intend to compare the two types of mice, but you also intended to compare the different biomarkers to each other. And so it doesn't make sense to me that t-tests were used for this comparison. So how do we fix it? Well, we can show a separate panel for each of my biomarkers, and now it's clear that I only intended to compare the two different types of mice, that the biomarkers should not be compared to each other, and they're simply different outcome measures. So my figure structure matches the study design and the analysis. Um, if you're looking for more information on how you design figures that match your, your study design and your statistical analyses, then when we're working with simple analyses of small data sets, it's often best to show one graph per analysis. 
And the graph should include all groups, time points, or conditions from the analysis, and it should show them the way they were treated in the analysis. And I don't have time to go over this today, but there is a figure in the circulation paper that illustrates different scenarios for stratified analysis or analysis with pool subgroups or testing for an interaction and shows you how you would design your graphs differently in those different scenarios. And this is just a reminder that to confirm that your analysis is appropriate for the structure of your data and your study design, the reader needs to know exactly what analysis you performed. So we did some meta research on this because in basic science papers, you'll often see a two sentence stat section that essentially says data were analyzed by t-tests or ANOVA as appropriate and statistical significance was defined as p less than 0.05. And so in this paper, we did a detailed assessment of whether we could determine what type of t-tests or ANOVA people were using um, in the general consensus was that very often we were missing information needed to make that determination and therefore we couldn't really determine whether the statistics were appropriate for the study design. So if you'd like to more use more about learn more about this, I went through an abbreviated version of the Q&A today, but there is a visual version on my Twitter account that has some additional questions I didn't address today. And there's also a webinar showing a more complete version of this Q&A that you can access. I'll spend a few minutes just talking about some other common problems. Um, one of the first things you can do is use semi-transparency or gradients to make sure that all of your data points are visible. So this problem most commonly comes up in dot plots, scatter plots, or flow cytometry plots, which are a particular type of scatter plot that has high density and is generated by a flow cytometer. So with dot plots, sometimes people will make strip plots where all the points overlap. And in peripheral vascular disease journals, we found that about half of dot plots had this problem. With scatter plots, again, you can have regions of overlapping points, making it difficult to determine how dense the data are at different places. And we saw this in 88% of scatter plots. And then we also saw this problem of overlapping points not being visible in 24% of flow cytometry plots. So how do we fix this? For dot plots, we've already talked about the importance of using symmetric jittering, and that's the best solution there. For scatter plots and flow cytometry plots, both of our x and y axis, axes are continuous, and they are actually measured values. So we cannot jitter because that would be changing our data. So what we can do instead is if we're working with a smaller sample size on our scatter plot, then we can make the data points semi-transparent. And this means that regions with overlapping points will show up a little bit darker than regions without overlapping points. If you have a flow cytometry plot or a lot of data points in a high data density, this strategy won't work as well. So you'll need to go to using a gradient. And this can be black and white or in a colorblind safe color palette. And if black and white, you might use grid lines. In a colorblind safe color palette, you might use something like this, where different dots are shaded in different colors. Speaking of colorblind safety, another important thing you can do is to replace jet or rainbow color maps with colorblind safe and perceptually uniform alternatives like viridis and civitis. So everybody is familiar with and likes rainbow color maps. Rainbows are pretty, we all like rainbows. Um, unfortunately, they're not great for data display. And one of the reasons is that they are colorblind safe. But a second reason is that these types of color maps introduce visual distortion, even for those of us with normal color vision. So this is an example of the Mona Lisa, as we would expect to see it in a jet color map, and then in a colorblind safe and perceptually uniform viridis color map. And what happens with the jet color map is that our eyes respond much more strongly to the reds and oranges and the yellows than they do to the blues and the greens. And so we look at this jet color map and we think, oh my God, there's something crazy going on with her chest and her face. Um, but we wouldn't see that in the other two color maps. And this is just due to this much stronger reaction. So again, our, the way that we perceive those colors is introducing a distortion in our perception of the data, which means that we interpret the data incorrectly. When you're working with colors, you always want to choose colorblind accessible colors. So it's important to remember that the most common form of colorblindness affects up to 8% of women, of men, and a half a percent of women of North European ancestry. And if you think about all of the people that will see your paper, um, both your co-authors, your reviewers, and your editors as is being reviewed, and then definitely your readers after it gets published, it's very likely that 
someone along the way of their paper getting published is going to have difficulty seeing your figures if they're not colorblind accessible and it will definitely be a problem for your readers because some of them will be colorblind. So how can you tell whether your figure is colorblind accessible? Well, one of the best strategies is to use free tools to simulate what a colorblind person would see. I use Color Oracle and you can download it for free. It'll take about 30 seconds. And once you have this installed, you can simply click a button to change the colors on your screen to simulate what a colorblind person would see. And it will allow you to show simulations for the three most common form of colorblindness. So I would highly recommend using this tool and checking all of your figures with it before you finalize them to make sure that your features are visible. Here's an example of what can happen if you don't use this tool um, or something similar. So this is what I would see with normal color vision, with the most common form of color blindness, and with the least common form of color blindness. So if I use red and green, then the features are indistinguishable for someone with the most common form of color blindness. If I use green and blue, the features are indistinguishable to someone with the least common form of color blindness. Whereas the color combinations of cyan and magenta or green and magenta are much more effective and allow readers with both forms of color blindness to see what's going on with my figure. Another point to emphasize is that it's really helpful to include a flowchart in your study to help readers understand your study design and assess the risk of bias. So flowcharts are things that look like this. Um, they give people an overview of your study design, whether there was randomization, how many animals or people or specimens you were working with at each phase, what your groups are and what the sample sizes are. And most importantly, they tell people how many observations were excluded and why observations were excluded. And this why is really important because why observations were excluded tells us whether there's a potential risk of bias in the study. So we know from our own meta-research and our analysis of peripheral vascular disease studies that only about a fifth of papers include a flow chart and 14% include a study design diagram, which is like a flow chart, but it doesn't have the numbers um, for the sample sizes or the details about exclusions. And there's also been meta-research done by others showing that when we exclude animals in a biased way, so for example, we get rid of an outlier that doesn't support our study hypothesis, then we greatly increase the risk of false positive findings. And we also know from the same study, for example, that 78% or 7 to 8% of studies using animal models to look at cancer and stroke were excluding animals without explanation. And then two thirds of studies didn't have enough information to access whether animals were excluded um, or not, which again means we can't evaluate the risk of bias. And our group has some rather similar data from papers looking at animal models of preeclampsia. So if you're wondering how you can make flowcharts for animal studies, it's helpful to use the experimental design assistant tool from the N3CRs. For observational studies, the STIRB guidelines provide sample templates for a um, study or for a study flowchart. And you can find similar templates for randomized controlled trials in the consort guidelines or for systematic reviews in the PRISMA guidelines. Um, I will skip the pie charts from the moment and then I'll skip to the last one, which is um, it's important to avoid using three dimensional graphs for two dimensional data. So the issue with three dimensional graphs with two dimensional data is that the extra dimension doesn't add any information and it makes the graph very difficult to read. So for example, if I look at this graph, I don't need the third dimension. It's not measuring anything. And it also makes it hard for readers to determine, should I assess the value based on the back of the bar or the front of the bar? Because those two values give you different numbers and I'm not sure which one is most appropriate. So essentially this is chart junk. It complicates the visualization. It doesn't give you added, added information and a two dimensional visualization would be much more effective. Okay, so that's all I have for today. I'm happy to welcome questions, comments or emotional outbursts.